Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Complete Guide to Light, part two of the Speed Light series. And I think we're actually at part four now of the entire series. Uh, good evening, Mark. How are you? I'm excellent. Well, I'm glad to see that you're still with us and we haven't killed you off yet, but we might have by the 20th because we've got quite a busy week next week, as you well know. Um, mate, just a, I suppose, I presume it's part of it. Is we doing a quick catch up on last week or are we just going straight for it? We're going straight, straight for it. Through. Okay, brilliant. As I said, anyway, the recording is on the Academy, so you can go and check it out. Um, but we're at, so in that case, I won't waste any more time, mate. I will give you the screen. It is being sent to you now. And just to remind everybody, any questions or queries you have for Mark, please pop them through the question panel. And I can see the screen, mate. I can see you loud and clear. I'm going to disappear. It's all yours. Excellent. Thanks. And good evening, everybody. So um, I had to split, split the uh, basics of Speedlight into two parts, otherwise we just obviously wouldn't really be covering enough and things. And remember, we've got some great film on the Academy to go off there and watch and catch up with and things really. But if there's anything specific you want me to cover in Speedlight part three and four, which is probably about two months away, uh, then please get in touch and we'll make sure we try and include those little bits and things really. So um, well, today we're talking about a little bit more mastering of the Flash and the Flash slaves. So so specifically to begin with, we want to talk about um, setting up the master flash or set, setting up the controller and just the basic understanding of a slave. Uh, that's te it's technically what Jay is for me and I'm his master. <laughs> I ask him to do something. There are times it doesn't work, just like a flash. Anyway, um, so we're going to be looking at the, as I said, the uh, basics of setting it all up and things. So. The first thing to understand that most speed uh, speed lights, that's the name we give to a small little flash unit that can be fitted onto the camera hot shoe. Uh, most of those uh, units will allow themselves to be turned into a master as well as a slave. Obviously, it depends on the price you're paying, the tech. Uh, the technology and the type of camera that you have as well, of course. Um, but um, I'm a Canon man still. Um, I moved over to Canon in. Ooh, I've forgotten. About 12 years, about 12 years ago, I think, I think it was. Uh, and I was Nikon before then, and basically Hasselblad, Pedtax, um, Mamiya, um, and, and Sinav actually before then. But anyway, speed, speed light. So we're going to talk just as if it's a flash. We're not talking Canon, Nikon, or whatever it be. Okay. So the first thing is to un understand that the master tells something else or another flash or in Jay's case uh, him to do something for me okay now it depends on the technology depends on what is built into the flash units themselves they're either going to work very efficiently or they're going to work inefficiently so in the good old days of the early days basically we would buy a third party um uh, just a, a sync to allow one flash to fire another flash by seeing flash go off OK, so those were little kind of golf balls we used to buy and with a, ca a cable dangling from other flashes. So we've been using multiple flashes in setups for many years, even little speed lights. Um, then the, um, the kind of the DSLR came along and speed lights grew up as well. And they began to actually have an infrared technology built into them that as long as they could see each other or see the beam, um, which could be bounced um, via card or foil, even around corners at times, uh, basically it would tell its self to fire based on the information that the master has sent then as the intelligence got better and better it wasn't just fire but it was also um, having more information from the master flash that it's sending off there so in other words what well we're looking on the back of the uh, speed light here for a minute you're seeing that this flash is a master because it says master it's also going to fire its own flash now in the top left hand corner just below the m you can see the little eye of uh, the icon of a speed light plus you've got three little lines that are coming out from uh, the front of it that means that the master flash as well will fire so if this was on a camera it would also fire its own speed light at the same time and then as far as the ratio in this case it's off as you as you can see um, and it's telling all flashes to fire on um, 
one third above one thirty second power. OK, so that's the basics of what it is. And all the different speed uh, speed lights, um, when they've got the technology in them, will allow you to change their channels. So it means that you can set groups of channels. If you're working with multiple photographers in a multiple scene, like graduations or events and so on, you can set your own channels. So basically, your master flash won't fire somebody else's slave units as such, really. So as a rule, when Whenever we're using speed light on demonstration at the likes of some of the big events, um, I always choose a completely different channel away from everything else in case you've got an idiot in the audience with a controller trying to guess which channel I'm on and screw up my demonstration, which has happened. And basically, I did punish them anyway. So that's the master. It tells the slaves what to do and how to perform. Then we have the slave. OK, so if you're lucky, all of the units that you buy, the speed lights, are going to be pretty much the same. Um, and the benefit of that, if one uh, begins to fail in some way, it's probably going to have some of its technology left in. So you might uh, get a sticky button or whatever it would be, or it might be in an older style of flash and you've brought in new styles of kind of flashes. Um, but pretty much if it has a slave, a slave mode, it's going to do what it's told by the master as such, really. OK, so when a flash is in slave, basically it's going to do its job. But the information is either going to be set manually on the flash itself, which you can still do, as we see in here, or it's going to be told how much flash to fire um, from the actual master itself. Now, why would you want to put the likes of slave units or master flashes into a manual exposed exposure mode? The reason that we uh, used to do this um, quite a lot, in fact, is when the, T uh, the TTL functions, the through the lens metering, wasn't as accurate as it is today. Um, and it was given an inconsistency in exposure as you zoomed in and out on the lens. Because remember, obviously, flash doesn't know you're going to zoom in and out. And it basically just sees more of an area to light, uh, to light up. If it's in a TTL, basically, it fires. It sees more dark space in a room and basically doesn't realize that it's still got to light the same little subject six feet away from you it's trying to actually do more so one of the reasons that we would meter the flashes individually uh, in a man a manual mode is so they perform the exact amount of flash exposure every single time and as you can see here in fact this slave is has actually been set into group a as well top right hand side we got channel um top left hand side we've got manual and then the bottom uh, in, the, in the middle, you're seeing what uh, channel it's in. In the uh, middle, then you're seeing the dial of the actual powers. And then obviously you can see the slave that it's actually digging, uh, that it's showing off there. So back to the master. Now, if we want to use ra ratios, we need to switch those on. So to do that, we basically would uh, go to the flash men menu itself press one of the buttons, whatever it would be relevant on your speed light, and then basically it would move itself through the function modes to get to where you want to be. So if you're seeing my little red light there now on the speed light, the one to the left, so there's two white lights just to the left hand side, the middle button next to mode, that's the one that will actually scroll through the different exposure types. You can see that there's four small white buttons underneath basically the black menu buttons and those obviously pressed to enter into the different kind of um, setups and so on. But your flashes may be completely different in look and feel and style and design in this. All I'm trying to get over to you is I guarantee you pretty much all flashes work in a similar way way. What I'd recommend you to do, though, if you're going into speed, uh, speed light in a serious way, you look for a flash that obviously is compatible with your camera, but it also has a wireless functionality instead of an infrared functionality. Why? Because basically you can put the flash further away and it, and it basically is pretty much guaranteed to fire instead of uh, playing a little bit of luck and so on with it. So um, one thing that you want to see on here, though, as well, in the top middle, at this point, it's showing 200 millimeter, whereas on the last slide, if we go back from it, it's showing 24 millimeter. Now, basically, the 24, basically, the camera is seeing that the lens has been zoomed to 24 mil. 
um, or you can set that in a manual zoom mode to basically um, uh, increase its uh, um, fo focus like a magnifying glass so the flash fires a longer distance away. So on the four buttons, um, like I was showing to you, on the left hand button it says ZM forward slash C dot FN. So ZM is zoom. So by pressing that, then it allows us to actually go in and change man manually the zoom facility. We're going to be seeing how that's used later on as well. Okay, so just remember what we're saying on here. Okay, so then um, as far as when it's um, either as a slave or a master, the first thing you need to do as a slave is tell it what group it's in. Uh, and in this case, the master is telling the A group to do one third above one third 30 second power and basically it's telling the B group just to fire 128th power okay so it's technically not in a ratio here it's actually in a manual set setting when we start to work in the A, B's and C's you can see now we've got three um, different um, flashes communicating. Now remember, in group A, I could have 6, 10, 20, uh, uh, 20 different speed, uh, speed lights. As long as they're all in channel 1, um, group A, they will all fire together when they're told to fire by the master, and similarly with B and C. Now some of the older speed, uh, speed light guns, um, when you were working with the, them in group C, they had no technical ability except for a manual setting on there. So obviously check your flash manual. <clears throat> okay, now I mentioned about the flash on and flash off when you're using a speed light on camera as a master flash. Um, some of the time, you're not really going to want to fire the flash on the camera. So if I basically grab that and that, so on the webcam for a minute, I'm showing you the uh, YN controller and I'm also showing you a speed, a speed light, a 600 speed light here. Now, both of these can control other flashes this speed light needs to be told to become a master, okay? The uh, trigger by itself is only a trigger, so it just needs to be linked um, to work with its slave units as such, okay? Now this one, if this is on the hot shoe of the camera, of course, it has no flash, so it doesn't fire. Whereas the speed light here does have a flash on it, so if this was the master flash, yes, on camera, Basically, that's what we're telling it to either fire its own flash during the exposure or not fire its own flash during the expo exposure. Might, might sound a little bit complicated, uh, complicated, but remember, like I say, as soon as you get a speed, a speed light, send, uh, send your, pub, uh, your partner out for a night with the girls or the boys, sit on the sofa, glass of wine in one hand, and basically photograph the television. In other words, point it and just actually see what all the buttons do and then read the manual and so on. I try and make myself a little bit of a, a note of anything that's new to do with a speed light. Should anything go wrong at any stage, I know how to master reset it and to go into the basic function that I need. Jay, any questions on the master flash and slave set uh, setup to begin with, mate? Uh, the, the only question about the, the, the master and the slaves, um, and I think it's a, we, we had a similar question last week, it's about mixing different makes of flash. Um, so can they be mixed or do you have to have a particular, uh, you know, master, if you like, or a, a way to... Okay, yeah, I know what you mean. So, um, for instance, Cactus make a system like Yongnu do, or Yongno do, and basically it can fit on the bottom of an existing flash, and basically whether it's a master flash or a trigger, it can tell those flashes to fire. What it might not have the capability of is being able to feed all the information like T a TTL and change your power. Now, the cactuses do. Um, I can't lay my hands on one, to be honest. I'm in the wrong room. But a little cactus controller, as I said, can fit on the bottom of any pretty much flash. You, you basically set the cactus into Canon mode, Nikon mode, whatever it would be, and then it basically 
uh, tells the flash what to do as far as the settings are concerned. Um, and some of them have a TTL functionality as well with it. So you can have some systems to work with it, but again, better to actually consult the uh, internet uh, before you actually make any purchases. Is that okay, Jay? Yeah, brilliant. I just, I'm just going to tell you this before uh, uh, before you move on. Brian, we've got Brian, one of our uh, uh, our techie masters from the academy on with us, obviously a Canon ambassador. The wireless uh, radio wireless system, this is amazing. I didn't know this. You might have known this. The new ones can take up to 16 devices in total, but the old infrared systems were limitless. How amazing is that? My God. He's the man that knows. Well, it's sad It's sad in a way because they've gone backwards in yeah. some ways, <laughs> forwards in another, isn't it? For 16, uh, well, 15 additional on one master, so 16 speed lights. Uh, can I can I just say if Brian is online and if he if he's sending you a link to his courses, I can guarantee you you won't have a better techie guy on speed light photography than Brian. Okay, he was uh, with us online doing some great film film for the academy for years and years and years. He's absolutely a superb guy and a techie geek. When I first went Wi-Fi. Oh, my God, in the good old days, Paul, Brian and myself were banging our heads together because basically all the Canon stuff was set up to work through a Mac. And I was a PC man. And and if I had one telephone call with Brian, I must have had 400. Uh, but he put up with me with a big smile on his face. But he used to have hair. And now he doesn't. Anyway, but if yeah, Brian's got some straight right. and he said, well, we ought to organize Speedlight Workshop for the TPA studios that he'll run. So that sounds like a brilliant right. idea. Absolutely agree with you. It's worth it. Perhaps we need a speed light weekend. And so it, we have like a hundred photographers down. We'll just go down to Barry and everybody else. I think that just, sounds like a much better idea, he's Brian. Just in before we get, before I leave you get going, that he did get the Wi Fi to work. <laughs> he did, yes, he did. And but he did lose he did lose his hair in the meantime. Anyway. <laughs> uh, um, okay. that's, it for, that's it for now, man. You're all good. Thanks, bud. Okay. So um as far as the the complication of flash, we put complications in the way. So in other words, we're either allowing the electronics to complicate ourselves. So in other words, we might be working in TTL exposure or a, an automatic expose, exposure. We're telling the flash to do in, T, in TTL mode. We don't know how to up the power or down the power. And basically, you might get a slightly light um, image uh, if it's basically somebody uh, on white across a white background. Or you might get a blown out exposure effect if you've got somebody who's in dark clothing on a dark background. The same things apply. The technology really hasn't changed that much, but make sure you understand the basic of putting your 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 exposure point on camera to where the basics are going to be going from. If in doubt, doubt though, I would always encourage you to learn the, dis, uh, the distance with your own flash um, how much it is at about three feet and six feet away from camera on camera to the subject. So in other words, if you uh, were to get an exposure and you put your flash between three feet away from the subject and then six feet away from the subject in both full, half and minimum power, at some stage in your life, you might get so soaking wet on a job that basically all the technology fails. <laughs> Yes, I speak from experience, and you need to know basically how it's all going to kind of kind of just get up and running straight away. Okay, so that's the basic understanding or the explanation, I should say, of master flash and a slave. Right. Now we need to talk about overpowering the ambient light within the scene. Now, obviously, if you're an automatic exposure photographer, you can use the camera and the flash settings to tell it to overpower the exposure. So in other words, um, let's say we've got a speed light on camera or off, but we want it to actually give one more stop exposure than the ambient light in the scene. Then we can actually set the flash up to give us a plus one and that will actually give us our stop. OK, uh, you can either do that from the flash itself or from the camera setting. Depends on your camera model, of course. But um, what we're going to talk, uh, talk about in the basic way is overpowering the scene through technique rather than what the actual camera or flash can do by itself. I agree that you should learn the automation, but you should also learn the manual element as well, because you can consistently get great images time after time after time. So the overpowering of the ambient light is the key thing. Now, of course, we've got this exposure triangle hasn't changed. Uh, and as long as I've been in photography, it hasn't changed as far as I'm aware since photography was invented as such. All right. So 
basically, in a nutshell, the exposure triangle, ISO, shutter speed, and ap aperture. But the flash exposure is controlled mainly by the aperture, all right? The ambient exposure is controlled by the shutter speed that you set. The ISO is used to raise or lower the sensitivity to the ambient light within the scene. In a nutshell, that's the easiest way for me to explain it. So if you try and get F22 on a speed a speed light and the speed light is too far away from the sub uh, the subject, there's probably a very good chance you're not going to be able to obtain it. Um, so that that means obviously speed light would be the wrong light source for you and so on. Or you need to try and get that light closer to the subject. But when we're going to meter the ambient light source and then we want it to be dark a uh, dark darker all we really need to be able to do is measure the ab the ambient take a photograph of the floor even even if it's in auto mode um, but I, I would look at the floor dial the exposure in so I usually set my shutter speed to 125th of a second first then I would actually set my aperture uh, sorry my ISO as the minimum i.e. around about 100 on Canon and then Basically, I'm looking for the aperture to give me the correct exposure within the scene. So let's say I've got 125th at f4, and basically it would base, uh, uh, give me an ISO of 100 at that point. So all I need to do now is either meter the flash, keeping the distance from the, sub, uh, the subject the, uh, the same when we're in manual mode, of course. I would meter it to one stop more than f4, i.e. 5.6. I would then set the aperture on camera to 5.6 and the other part of the shutter, i.e. 125th and the ISO. And then basically I've o overpowered the ambient light by one stop. But remember that the... Um, the sensitivity, sorry, that the shutter speed is a quick way to bring the am ambient back alive or shut it down. So because I'm at 125th of a second, if I open it up to a 60th, basically I've lightened the scene again. OK, if I bring it down to a third, a third, a thirtieth, I've done two stops, a fifteenth is three stops and so on and so on. So I'm overexposing the image at this point, of course, because in the exposure triangle, I, over, I only overpowered the image by one working stop. That's it. But what I can do is darken the, uh, the ambient light even more without touching the flash by basically uh, changing the um, shutter speed upwards. So from 125th, 160th, 200, 200 above, and obviously once we go to 200 above, we need to work in the high speed sync. So that is the basic of the exposure effect that we're trying to do. So when we start to look at this now, this is uh, a photograph. The sun is behind her. It's hidden behind the clouds. This is a JPEG straight out of camera. We've got a small speed light with a small soft a soft box, and basically it's on a pole. Uh, I've got to say that every time I look at this image, it looks like she's only got the one foot. Um, anyway, it's a whole different thing. <laughs> Shut up, Mark. Um, but the reason we've got darkened clouds behind is because we've underexposed the ambient by one stop. OK, so as it is, the speed light is so close to her. It's only got a small little soft box on there. Perhaps it's only got one layer of diffusion. And as is, it's allowing me to get out a very big um, aperture out of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the exposure itself. But if we start to work in the likes of high speed sync, like we talked about last last week, it now allows me to get back to being the creative photographer I want to be. In other words, I believe that of the true kind of creativity of the photographer is the choice of aperture, the choice of the style of lens, i.e. wide or long, and obviously the height that I shoot from. Those are the three things. Then I add in the lighting control that really makes the image dynamic. So the first thing that I want to do is obviously choose my shooting style. In this case, case shallow depth of field, wide angle lens. So um, in fact, uh, this is uh, taken from a short film that we made for Last Light by Manfrotto when they launched the new EasyBox 2 but years and years ago. Um, but I'm basically, um, I've got the uh, speed light off camera on a cable, in fact, 
uh, and it's on a pole and I'm tracking back. So I'm basically shooting in full fashion style uh, as if she's a celebrity, she's walking towards me and I'm getting that load of a variety of images and so on. So when I work above 200 of a, sec a second, remember I've got to move into HSL, the high, uh, the high speed sync then at that point. So when we start to look at um, the ambient light, so we can see the sky behind it, we can see the sea and everything else uh, with the image on the right, uh, the right hand side. And what I'm doing is creating an exposure on her. The image on the right hand side, in fact, has a flash being fired, but that is going to be our accent light, as you can see from the highlight, just running down the arm and just running down the side of the face and the neck. Unusual to put an accent light on women's flesh, as I've done here, but it was to actually bring out the solidness of the body tone and so on. OK, so the image on the right hand side is technically just a test shot to make sure that the separation light, the accent light is running in the right exposure, which we can see it is because there's no burnt out pixel in the detail of the white on the skin. Whereas the image on the left hand side is with the two flashes combined and the ambient light in the scene. Obviously, if I opened the shutter speed up to 125th, the sky would be much lighter than we're seeing now. Next shot here, this is done at 320th of a second. Again, remember what I can't control is how bright the sky is on that day. We never know what it's going to be like. It could be the end of the day that we're photographing, the beginning of the day, and the middle of the day. It doesn't matter. Um, but ba basically what I'm trying to do is overpower the scene to be, bring more drama with my light lens and aperture choice. Well, in this case, the aperture will have no real dif a difference because I'm going for a quite a, a mid-range aperture for depth of field. But re uh, really, it's the shutter speed combined with the position of the speed light that is giving me the drama within the image. So remember, the light really is where we paint it, where it comes alive and everything else. But in the use and the position of the speed light is where we're actually creating the, dra uh, the drama. But we need to be able to control our background and how bright or dark it is. Right. Jay, any questions on that so far? Uh, nothing specific on what you've been talking about. I've got a question I'm going to hang on to because I think it's good, but it's a general more speed like question and shooting question. OK, so um, this next part, I thought we'd just go quick, quickly through a selection of wedding images when and when not to use it as far as I'm, I'm concerned, as well as how to use the flash. All right. So if you remember what we were talking about last week, we talked about the ability to bounce uh, so a direct a slight bounce, upward bounce off a ceiling, side bounce off the likes of a wall. Now, when I say upward bounce off a ceiling, that, that could be also a bounce card. It could be the catch light card or the key uh, the key light card that is basically can pull up from the speed light itself. If you're not familiar with that, um, basically all I'm doing is I'm lifting up this little catch light and tilting it in the speed uh, the speed light when it's on camera uh, on camera and that will just give a little bit more fill actually in towards the actual group itself or into the sub uh, subjects um, in the same way is that um, if we're using the flash so in other words this front of the flash with my name on it is coming towards you. If I'm bouncing this off a wall, I might have my hand in front of it. So if you're the subject, I might have my hand or a piece of card in front of it so I don't get any direct spill coming on towards you. Another way to do that, of course, is to zoom the flash or have a controller on the front, a shaper on the front, so it doesn't actually spill onto you. Um, I am a massive fan, by the way, when the um, flash is in the bounce mode, OK, so I'm running about 45 degrees here. I usually leave the wide angle diffuser down. Uh, it comes out by default. But also, if I'm going into a direct flash, so on a sunny day with a group, I'm going to use um, at around about 10 to 12 feet. I, I usually run a 24 to 105 for all my group photography and my general kind of candid images. And around about uh, between about um, 10 to 20 feet, I can get away with actually the diffuser on the front. Once I go back from that, of course, I have to actually push this in. And basically, I have to increase the power on the back of the speed, uh, the speed light itself. 
itself. Now remember, um, at present I'm using the Yongno uh, speed lights with it and things really. Um, why? Because it's a cheap entry into speed lights and the rate of uh, speed lights I go through, uh, even in the good old days of Canon, it's just too expensive. So uh, I'm always trying to find a cheaper alternative. So when we sit Talk, we're talking through these images. I'm going to talk about bounce, direct, side light, and so on. So this is when not to use flash because we want to keep the ambient and the quality of the light within the scene. Flash would actually pick up all the detail in the front, which would overpower the image, even if we we're using it in a fill mode. So in other words, the fill, it's around about a stop to a stop and a half below the, work, uh, the working exposure. Um, but I don't want to actually kill all that ambient. Yes, I want to do this here because basically it's the gifts being given. I'm, I'm under contr uh, no control of the lighting in the scene. I need to make sure that things are going to be visible when the jewelry, uh, jewelry is revealed. So at this, at this point, remember, we're only talking about flash on, cam on, cam on camera. This is a 45 degree tilt with the catch light card out. And the flash is running on TTL, but the camera in manual mode throughout the whole of the session. No, as she goes up the stairs, if I had flash on camera at this point, it would put too much detail underneath the stairs and on the wall. And obviously, I don't want to add any more extra distraction away from the bride. As she walking into the room with a dress, a little bit of a bounce light. Um, this still on the catch light. So in fact, at this point, the flash is still at 45 degrees and it's just acting as a fill. Again, a good stop below the work in ambience in TTL mode. No flash here because obviously you're using the re uh, room light to keep the detail. If I use flash on camera at this point, the person on the right hand side who's doing up the back of the dress would be flash lit and it would take the uh, attention away from the dress. So I've um, this is just a test shot, in fact, but this is a quick shot uh, as I've sat her in the wind, wind, window and basically with the, some of the color images, I decided to use a little bit of bounce flash off the ceiling. Uh, in, in this case, I couldn't because of the, shad, uh, the chandelier, so I'm bouncing it off a bounce card. So in other words, the camera's on its side. The catch light is basically here, but I put a catch, a bounce card actually on the side to give me more lighting quality. I always try and do in the direction of the light source. So because all the light is coming in from the right hand side of the window, as we can see, the camera is turned to the right hand side. So now the flash direction with the catch light or the bounce card will basically be running in from the same direction as the light source itself. And this is obviously no, this is where I would want her not looking at me at all. So she might be playing with the engagement ring, doing up a, a bangle, doing the shoe up, whatever it be. But uh, as I said, really what I don't want is her looking at me with no flash, because if she looks at me, I need to make sure there's good light on on her. But every, every time she's looking away and doing her own thing, basically I'm not using any flash at all. So because I'm against the light here, again, the, the, the bounce light, 45 degree catch light card, TTL, back to normal. Now they're actually with the actual light source, but I'm still using flash on camera in the bounce in the same way, just to lift the detail and give an evenness across the group of sisters and mum. I'm down in a very dark hall, uh, a hallway. The front door is open, but I'm still using the, uh, um, the flash on camera with a bounce card to illuminate the group more. There's uh, no need for flash here, but it wouldn't be that bad if you were you, you using flash anyway. They'd walk in directly into sunlight, so I don't really need it. But if they were backlight or if I was um, on too much shadow, then I would actually switch the speed light on. No need for real speed light here if... Um, I didn't have uh, kind of mixed lighting going on. As it was, there was a lot of side lighting coming in onto dad on the left-hand side. Uh, very little because of the shade spilling onto the bride. So again, the catch light card, the bounce for uh, the 45 degree in TTL. No, no flash here, but as long as you're in control of your flash, you could actually get away with speed light without any trouble here at all. Just control it down by about a stop. Got to use it as they're going into church because it's a very old Welsh chapel. Same because I'm working against the pure sun coming straight into the lens. Without the speed light fire, uh, firing at this point, um, I would have no contrast in the highlight and I just completely lo lose it. So I need it. 
again a group I need to bring evenness in the exposure across the whole group so yes we're using it in the same way but this point the um, Cam, uh, the speed light flash can be used in 45 degrees, as I was saying to you, with a catch light card, or it could be turned and directly straight onto them. I would say if you're a, a shorter photographer, I would try and encourage you to actually get up higher, um, but because basically I'm, I'm slightly taller, even though I shrunk in a, cent a centimeter and a half over the last year, I've been told recently, um, basically um, I still can put most of the actual shadow from the flash behind the, sub uh, the subjects. Again, um, yes here, because they're walking against the light, so I want a little bit of contrast to light in. I don't need the actual um, flash going off with the direct sunlight. Um, I could if I wanted to, because he's looking at me, but I probably wouldn't. No, because we're using all that fantastic light coming through the, um, uh, the door now of the house again. And basically, once more, I'm using that lovely kind of dra uh, drama of the light. If I was going to use any off-camera flash at this point the light would be positioned at the 10 o'clock position with no flash firing on camera, camera so if I was using a master flash on camera it would be set not to fire it would be used just to trigger another flash and that flash would be running at the 10 o'clock position pointing back towards the bride no flash again in this case I've gone for a complete creative image we don't want it to fire that is absolutely essential for me, so I'm getting all this lovely kind of lens flare coming in and so on. No in here, because if I was using any flash, it would bring too much detail close to camera alive quicker. Even though I've upped my ISO, I've dropped my shutter speed down, and I've basically uh, wide, over, uh, wide open, I've got enough light within the scene to actually get the work in exposure. If this was a winter wedding, it'd be a different thing all together. I'd definitely be running with an assistant who would actually have the uh, off-camera flash in hand ready all the time with a small soft uh, softbox in this case it would be on a pole at my uh, three at my three o'clock position which would be in the same line as their wall and pointing towards them or I could run them up the stairs to actually have the flash coming back down the stairs to create more drama as far as the shadow coming forward I, I did run flash here as they're coming towards me because the sun is very low and very strong. I need to actually even the contrast out within the Im image. Same thing within the car itself as they leave the house. And then, of course, I'm straight into the marquee. Because I'm basically in pretty much no light, I've got to use um, people photography, just like an event photographer. So either a softbox or a, a bounce card to actually capture some of the light. But again, a wide angle element. Same here again. Def, uh, definitely for color photography, uh, I always use the, but so whereas most of my people shots like we're seeing here again uh, are in black and white, when they're looking towards me, they tend to actually be in color as far as the, uh, the sale is concerned. This I wouldn't use the flash for, of course, either than though I've got extreme ISO running. I'm thinking up to uh, 6400 or whatever it would be, um, F. 1.2 or something, um, basically uh, no light within the scene at all. But if I use flash here, of course, the people in the, fore, uh, the foreground to me would be lit. Um, okay, I can position myself so no uh, shadow would be cast onto him, but it'd be lighting of the front subjects would be the killer. So you might think that this image with all the mixed lighting going on in the tent, that's what I was having to cope to cope with during the, speed, uh, the speeches. I, I, decide, I decided to go with it. They had all this color, they had all this theme, so I was going to use it during the course of the uh, the sessions themselves and things really. So yes, again, because obviously she's a key person, uh, it's gone very dark, just blowing the um, uh, aperture, so I'm down to around f4, 2.8. I, I don't usually go lower than 2.8 um, because of depth of field with the adult face. Um, if it was in a poor a portrait mode, I'd basically be shooting no less than F4 because of the depth of field from uh, the eye to the front of the nose by design. <clears throat> um, but as far as the ambience here, obviously we've got a high sensitivity of ISO and a slower shutter speed to actually bring everything up. Um, yes, I would use a little bit of bounce splash here. In fact, just by coincidence, the guy on the left-hand side now, he's become a pretty much uh, a strong rock and roll photographer straight out of uni, fell on, his, uh, uh, fell on the luckiest uh, day of his life uh, 
pretty much toured the war, uh, world last year with two new uh, um, uh, two new artists, a guy called Will Beach. And uh, basically, uh, he was a non-photographer uh, when I met him, just a keen photographer you know, going through uni. uni. Um, but basically, uh, he's landed on his feet, lucky devil, as it were. So yes, a catch light here uh, with a bounce light again. But again, once more, no no flash, just using the light within the scene itself. So if I had to use flash, if I was shooting a Greek or an Asian wedding, I need assistance with flashing hands, and they know that they would be running at the drama. So they'd be running beyond the 9 o'clock or beyond the 3 o'clock, or they'd be at the prostitute zone, which would be between the 4 and the 7 o'clock position. And obviously, picking up all the color, last shot of the night, basically the shot here with all the color and things ready. Any questions on lighting weddings, Jake? Uh, we do, mate. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I missed it. I was paying attention for once, uh, but in case I missed it, uh, the particular sh uh, question about shooting groups. Um, so uh, I'll read it as it as it reads. It's better. Shooting a group in low light area and only space for one speed light. What's the best way of getting an even light across the subject? If you can't get an umbrella. I basically just run on camera. Okay. So the um, the umbrella will allow the speed light to get itself bigger by design. Um, speed light flash is rectangular, as we talked about last week. And as it comes out of the end, it just tries to get bigger. All flash, in fact, tries to get bigger. It's it's an explosion. Um, so um, what what we want to do though is have an evenness as it gets bigger. That's why we usually diffuse things at the front, or we use the likes of an umbrella to actually increase the spread of the light and the softness of the light at the same time. Uh, a question came in, and, and it was at the point when you were talking about uh, high speed. And the question was, why wouldn't you leave your flash on high speed all of the time? It's a very good point. Um, again, it's just habit. I, I want to be in control of every single thing that I'm doing. And once you get familiar with your kit, you know, as soon as you start to move up to uh, above the 200th of a second on a sunny day, you instantly put your flash straight onto a high speed sink. It's discipline uh, rather than anything else. It keeps you thinking. So um, I might be in second cur uh, second curtain sink as we talked about last week, when they're in the aisle coming up uh, uh, the walkway, so the flash fires at the end instead of at the beginning, so I can kind of get it all nice and sharp. Um, and basically, I want to walk outside then to actually make sure that I'm going to work in the light that is available, and I don't want to really lose any power of the flash. And obviously, one thing that um, high-speed sync does, it basically will just take a proportion of that flash, and I want the consistency of the flash. Uh, advice when using the flash, any tips on avoiding glare in people's glasses? Be tall, be taller. <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, oh, this was a good question. I don't know which image it was. There was a couple of bounce flash images of a wet wedding ladies in rooms with yellow or colored walls. Why didn't the ladies take the wall colors? That makes sense. So I guess why did the color not bleed onto them? from the bounce? Um, it wouldn't have been bounced off a wall then. It would have been bounced off the catch like card, yes? All right, brilliant. Okay. Uh, where am I? Um, have you ever used or your thoughts on these sphere-like uh, reflector systems rather than a bounce card? For the... Never used them. Never used them. Okay. And uh, do you have a preference to use the speed light on ETTL for weddings and do you combine yes. two speed lights together to half the recycling times? No. So I, I usually, on weddings, I'm using them in ETTL mode anyway, which is basically a Canon TTL. <coughs> but um, unless I'm putting two speed lights or three speed lights into a softbox, <clears throat> there's no reason for me to join them together. So if I was having to put um, speed lights going through some of the big last lights, soft box, it big, uh, the big ones, yes, I would use the uh, duo, trio, or the quad bracket um, to obviously use the flashes in there. And that's one of the reasons where speed light in the likes of the third party speed lights is much cheaper to do when you're bringing them all together. Um, so the simplest answer is yes, in, T I'm in TTL, 
um, but I own I only combine speed lights together if they're in a big speed light box, soft box. Uh, brilliant. Or, or bounce umbrella, of course. <laughs> that's all the questions on the wedding section. I've got a few generic ones that I'll hang on to. Okay, mate. So um, then we start to look at uh, setting up the speed light itself. So don't. the first thing I want to say is don't be afraid of on-camera flash. <clears throat> Just be afraid of using it badly. <laughs> so think about what the flash can do based on your camera position, uh, physical position. So, for instance, the image that we're seeing in front of us now is basically a speed, a speed light slightly up and above the camera position. Uh, okay, here. So if this was on a bracket on camera at this point or even on the hot shoe, I could pretty much produce this same shot, okay, just as we are now, with a slight zoom effect on speeded light. So taking the wide angle diffuser off on the back, setting this from the normal um, setting going into the zoom. So I'm not sure if you can see on here, but I'm basically just pressing the zoom and I'm dialing in the zoom to go bigger and bigger up to 200 on these so that will focus in the light but what i can't do is turn the camera to the vertical position because that would then move the flash shadow in an evenness dropping behind her because of my height it would then actually create a shadow coming in from the left to the right or the right to the left yeah so i'd have to have a bracket that as i move the camera around the speed light was able to actually keep its same position and there are those around as well but don't be afraid uh, of doing it, but obviously try and avoid from wasting all these pixels. I mean, when I moved over to uh, Kodak uh, DSLRN, it was a 2 million pixel uh, camera. I think that is less than any camera phone that you can buy today. Um, then we moved up to the Kodak uh, 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 760, which was again a uh, uh, Nikon. And then we moved up to the uh, Kodak um 14n uh and then we moved over to the canon 5d because it was the first full frame with a decent iso canon uh, say kodak had a full frame um, but the iso wasn't very good so again here i can shoot in the vert uh, sorry in the horizontal mode knowing that i'm going to trim down the sides but the reason i'm shooting in that way is to keep the shadow in the right section itself when we start to look at the creative portrait then, how can we use lights within the scene to change the look and the feel? So just by using one light on the subject and another light on the background um, or onto the hair or both would allow us to completely change the look and the feel. These are some of the images that we actually shot on the last light by Manfrotto stand uh, a couple of years, a couple of years back, in fact. Um, so the image on the left hand side is two lights and, and the image in the middle is two lights, but the image on the right hand side is just the one light. OK, the two images on the left, um, the one image the left hand image is being used with being lit on the background whereas the image in the middle there's light being uh, lit, lit on the hair but it's also being allowed to spill onto the background as well when we start to use the setting up using color we can start to explore the things that the modern day dslr can do along with gels on on cameras as well so when we start to actually look, look with color, the first thing that we can play around with without changing anything on the flash itself, we can obviously go from night to day by just actually putting it from a normal white balance into the likes of a tungsten balance, which gives a blue effect like we're seeing here from white light. Yeah. If the exposure on the face is burning out, you'll just get a blue tone. So nat naturally you can get this kind of image no matter what. However, uh, when we start to really want to work with gels, we can work with them in subtlety or in drama so the image on the left is uh, a gel it's three it's three gels in fact uh, a blue gel which is spilling onto the girl and the um, background then we've got a red gel spilling onto the hair and then we've got a, tur a turquoise gel just uh, just coming from the lower right hand side remember again um, you can pretty much change the colors rapidly by the likes of photographing a gray a gray card lit with a gel and basically cut and balancing on that so it's, it's real good fun but you get some really crappy effects as well as some brilliant effects whereas the image on the right hand side here we're using gel in the most subtlest of way just to actually put it onto the speed light to actually light the background 
I'm a massive fan of CTO and double CTO as well. So a, C, a CTO is a color temperature orange gel, which is the same color as tungsten liotin. So if we were to set, like we talked about last week, yeah, if we set the camera color balance into color temperature orange, which is the tungsten icon, basically, and we put a, a color temperature orange gel on the front of the actual spig light flash, we basically make anything in the scene that is daylight or flash blue. And that's what we just see in left and right. So in fact, there's two speed lights running without gel on, okay? Those are the ones that we're seeing in the background on the right-hand side of the little square lights. But because they're spilling all around the place and they are white light, but in fact, I'm telling the, ca uh, the camera that it's being lit with, tung uh, with tungsten light, the color balance shifts everything white to blue. However, the speed, the speed light that is going onto the face is the one with the color temperature orange gel on, and that is the one that obviously gives us this clean white face skin tone in exactly the same way here, okay? So the image on the left is basically without CTO on the speed light, all the lights still fire, and now we've got a normal kind of color. But the image on the right hand side, we've in introduced a, C, a CTO, a color temperature orange gel, onto the key light flash. That we've changed our uh, white balance on camera to tungsten, and basically whatever is white light in the scene now becomes blue. If you double CTO, uh, you're going to find it very, very hard to color balance in post production without a gray card. Um, and, and some skill. So I would usually encourage you to actually custom balance from a gray card on camera um, specifically because that, that will give you your color, color balance running throughout the whole series of images uh, without having to do much uh, uh, post uh, the post-production. Flare, I think flare is a great, a great way to actually bring some drama into an image. So the image on the left-hand side, <clears throat> We're seeing two lights being used, one coming in from the 10 o'clock high and another coming in from the 2 o'clock high. But basically, the 10 o'clock high one is being pointed slightly towards the camera more. The lens hood is off, and it's allowing some of the glass to see the flash. However, just by taking the lens off, uh, the lens hood off fully and going a little bit wider, the image on the right-hand side can be achieved in two, two ways. The way I achieved it was just by breathing on the front of the lens, and then basically it takes a natural flare. Or we could introduce the likes of a filter in front of the lens, which basically will see the, uh, uh, the light as well, especially if it's a soft filter, and it will actually create the same flare effect. Flare, of course, for me, I like to do it in camera instead of the post. So this is all done on camera. Uh, okay, it's a little bit of luck and um, uh, kind of uh, just uh, playing around with it and things really. But again, it creates some much more drama, especially when you're seeing the results instantly in front of you. Yes, you look at certain times, you go, that's a shame I did that, Mark. Shame you should, do, should have done it in post in the post production. But again, it's all about being the camera, uh, sorry, the photographer in camera instead of just relying on the post production. Ring, ring flash for me, I'm an absolutely avid fan of, you know, the ray, uh, the ray flash. Um, so basically what I try and do is make sure that the ray flash um, basically overpowers the background. Um, it struggles a little bit when I'm in high speed sync, but it can do the job. Uh, basically, when we're using it in the likes of here, you get this uh, amazing kind of chin strap sh shadow that it creates around the body and, and the face itself. So if we could zo uh, zoom in close on her body here, where her shadow is just behind her on the right hand side onto the wall, there's a very sharp black line. And that is the actual shadow effect that the ring flash creates. Um, you can see it, in fact, on a face. Um, and they call it the chin strap shadow because it's basically just creates this dark line whereas the light hits the chin and then instantly there's a slight small space between uh, the shadow and where it next hits the actual skin of the neck and hence the chin strap shadow. Shutter speeds, of course, can really change the actual look and feel. So we can either move camera in a darkened room and allow the ambient light um, to kind of trail, 
or we can actually uh, allow the, am the ambient light to trail, so move that, in other words. Uh, in either case, you really need to work with a darkened room, um, because otherwise, any time the skin hits any of the uh, uh, visible ambient light, it's basically going to add some blur into the effect, which can work, but it can also actually fail at the same time with it, things really. So remember, playing around with slowing shutter speeds down and so on with it. As far as speed lights and how many, um, as I was saying to you, first of all, do not be afraid of on-camera on flash. This is on-camera flash, 24 mil lens, zoomed to, I think it's uh, the likes of 105 here. That just puts all this lovely hot spot bang smack in the middle, eliminates from light, lighting all the other walls and pillars around the scene, and creates a dramatic image straight away. You can see the same thing. They're out, out on a location. It's a terrible weather, weather day. <clears throat> and just by basically pointing uh, the zoom lens on camera towards them creates this almost spot, spotlight effect to create this kind of uh, dancing stage. And you can pretty much, if you squint now, uh, uh, it will allow your eyes to go out of focus and increase the, co uh, the contrast. You'll start to see the, sp uh, the shape of the speed light. Yeah, uh, as it goes from a, tri a rectangle trying to become round by its design. But in the zoom effect, instead of lighting up the whole wall, it's just lighting the center of the scene. This light is just actually off towards the side, giving a little bit of uh, uh, the light. Again, once more, using speed light here just as a fill to even out the light or bring some contrast into the scene. The speed light used here with the girl and the dogs to actually give the full illumination. Here we're dropping down the uh, two stops uh, of the scene towards the end of day, but creating more drama on the actual subject. Same thing applied, but adding gel now in post-production. So using a gradient <clears throat> in the likes of Bridge and Camera Raw to create the gradient effect. You can do it in, light, in Lightroom as well, but adding in some different kind of colors and so on. Again, one light again from above, a street, a street light effect. Uh, one light just to give the illumination, but allowing the flare to come in from the natural light coming in from behind. One speed light on camera again to actually zoom in, but held higher now, just to actually give this great shadowing effect, brings in a kind of a CEO using the high speed sync to actually really darken the lights of uh, the daylight from behind. We already talked about this image using, so photographing in the horizontal, but um, basically being higher, zooming in a little bit, just to actually put that extra bit of light on towards the face. And never forget, you know, uh, with the likes of the high, a highlight or a white, a white wall, bouncing the speed light into um, uh, the likes of a highlight or bouncing it off a white wall will create a much bigger, softer light source as such across the whole scene. When we start to use two speed lights, we need to actually think about what each light in the scene is doing. So in other words, we're usually going to use one light as a key and another as separation or ac accent. The small image on the left-hand side is showing the um, position uh, uh, of the separation on the hair, uh, the hair light coming from the 10 o'clock position. And this is uh, exposed one stop less. Shot here when we start to work with it, the two images on the left are light in the background, but they're being shone through some cardboard gels, <coughs> zooming in the flash to create more or less of the actual pattern on the background. Whereas the image on the right hand side, uh, the separation light is being overpowered by two stops, which creates this flare kind of element and burning out and things. But you've got to be aware that we are losing pixel definition to actually at this point. But it is, as I said, being used for effect. Two lights off camera, one is the key, one is separation. Two lights off key off um, uh, camera, one at the nine, the nine o'clock, which is the key light, one at the uh, two o'clock position with the separation light. Same here, just using some smoke bomb to create more drama and to diffuse the little speed lights on a very wet day. I think that in, that short film is on the Academy as well, Jay, I think this is. Uh, it was a day we were trying out some new cactus flashes years and years and years ago. Uh, shot here with a girl and a horse, two, two speed lights again. One to the um, uh, nine, uh, sorry, the three o'clock position and another running uh, close to the 
three o'clock and we've got a three o'clock and we've got a five o'clock light running here I believe I can't remember exactly exactly that one now again uh, two speed lights being used uh, one with an umbrella and basically one near camera but to actually give the set uh, the separation three speed lights here now one with a C, um, CTO gel on that's the, the key uh, the key light uh, the one that we're seeing here basically the others are just given separation so you can see the blue on the floor on the right hand image that is being created in fact by the left hand light just on the edge of the uh, exposure it's not giving any illumination onto the girl it's just to bring illumination to the rocks and then we've got another speed light running in from the background to give an accent and separation light three speed lights again one at the uh, seven o'clock position near camera one on the ground to actually give some illumination to the wall and then another one on the uh, uh, three o'clock position but, po but pointing across just to bring a little bit of more detail in and in towards the floor itself. So again, remember my favorite setup is a speed, a speed light on a knuckle bracket on a light stand connected to an external battery and having some or uh, some variety of accessories at hand, everything from a soft, a soft softbox to honeycombs to snoots and gels. Those are the key things for me. If I'm going to use a softbox today, uh, pretty much I'm using the Easybox 2, um, and I'm loving the actual uh, gridded um, box as well with it and things. It's the, fa uh, the favorite setup, but don't, but don't be afraid as well to use the Easybox 2. It's available with both a white interior and a, sil a silver inter interior. I believe the Joe McNally version comes with a white interior, where the standard Easybox 2 comes with a silver interior. I can't remember exactly, but I'm sure that's the case. Um, but never be afraid of taking the external baffle off as well, because they have two uh, layers of diffusion, one in the inside, one on the outside. Of course, if you drop down the wide angle diffuser on your speed, your speed light anyway, that is a basically another diffuser as well, so you can actually have a, a lot more control. Question time, Jay, and then it's pizza time. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Well, um, you've answered quite a lot as we went, which was quite good. Going, oh, Mark's answered that now. Mark's answered that, which is, is I thought you would. Uh, but I will read the ones that I have for you. Um, why? Why would you use double CTO to increase the blueness in the sky behind even more? Uh, brilliant. Okay, so <laughs> I'll go back to the ones that I hang on to. Um, so I had a question quite early on uh, due to cost and kit, and 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 um, can I mix a speed light with a studio light? Yes, you can. So and particularly the question was, um, so can I use my speed light as the fill and use my studio light as the main light? One second, Jay. Sorry about that. It's I right. thought we had an intruder in the studio then. <laughs> the dog, it was the dog who dropped a radler. Yeah, <laughs> she's been playing in years. She has. I wonder where she's gone. Um, okay, sorry, Jay. So can, can we use the speed light as a fill light and the studio light as the main light? You could do, yeah, and you could use it as a, um, a fire as well and things, really. So it depends on what your studio flashes can do. Obviously, uh, make, uh, make sure that the uh, flash doesn't fire on the pre-flash if your speed lights uh, fire a pre-flash. If they do have a pre-flash and you have the ability on your studio flash to tell it not to fire on the pre-flash, then obviously put that technology in there. Uh, Brill, um, does the flash have to be activated on camera to make sure it's sending a signal to the others, i.e., can you test the flash connectivity by testing flash guns not attached to the camera hot shoe? Does that make sense? Yes. So the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, it's a, a, a two seconds. I'm reading this one. It charges up and then soon I'm plug one more. Can they? Oh. So somebody's saying that they have a, a battery pack, but it's a, it's quite old and not used uh, for a while, and it charges up, but as soon as it's unplugged, it won't work. Is that often that they just die? Buy a new one. Yeah, cool. Uh, we're getting there, two seconds. What's the difference between using a white or a silver diffuser? Um, specularity of the light. 
Um, so basically, if it's um, specular, silver gives a sharper light return and it will be a, a, crisp, a crisper light source as such, really. Um, whereas a white will actually be a softer and a more diffused light. Um, if using two speed lights for a dance in a dark room, would you shoot HSS off camera? Uh, I wouldn't shoot HSS, no. I, I'd be shooting um, uh, <laughs> second Kurt in sync. So by doing that, it basically puts the light trail behind them at the end of the exposure rather than at the beginning. Um, that would be the first thing that I do. And then basically the next thing would be to put them at the 10 and the 2 o'clock position. So it's never a flash near camera. Uh, if I was going to, if I had a third flash, I'd have the ability to switch my um, speed light on camera, the master uh, flash, in other words, uh, to either fire or not. Uh, Brill, and the last question that I have for you, mate, um, I might have answered it already, uh, and it's a question really. Do you know, do the Alinchrom triggers trigger speed lights? Uh, they can, yeah. There's a receiver that you can buy to actually go on the bottom of your speed light. And that, my friend, is all the questions for tonight. Brilliant. Did Brian send send a link to any courses or anything? Uh, or no, not? he's going to phone me tomorrow and we're going to do exactly what we said. We're going to get one in the TPA diary because he needs a base. So why not? Okay. Well, before before everybody leaves, then can you just put if you're interested in a speed light course down here in our studios in Barry uh, with the likes of myself and Brian? So just basically just put a simple in the question panel. Yes. And then we just get a good instant kind of feedback on the night, really. We won't hold, uh, we won't hold you to it. No, they're all bucked on now, mate. That's it. They're tough. It's tough. We've, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's it. You've signed your life away, guys. You're in. Yeah, there's plenty of interest there, mate. That's definitely going to happen. So, Brian, if you're still with us, we will chat tomorrow, my friend. We'll Brilliant. Chat. I think it'd be a good thing to actually do a couple of day one, to be honest, if Brian's up for that. Because then, you know, people learn at a certain uh, um, kind of pace and things, really. And again, possibly with the two of us doing it, I I'm, I'm not sure about my diary, but I'm sure um, we can work something out. So at least I'm sure Brian will be able to come down and actually do some courses here. But it'd be good to actually do the two of us because we can get a lot more actually on the course. And then uh, we can go off actually down onto location. We can hide different models. We can get down on the beach as well as locations to actually shoot some kind of variety. So we'll, we'll definitely start that development for you guys and see if we can do something for you for this year as well brilliant that's it my friend we're all good i'll take it over for a few reminders but thank you again for another great great one and so lots remember of thanks that. in the chat as well oh my pleasure so remember uh next time we're going to start looking at um natural light okay so we're going to start off with session one is natural light and looking at how we can actually shoot great images um and whether it's landscape, poor portraiture, whatever it would be, actually in just using natural light, light itself and reflectors. Brilliant. Thanks, Jay.